So, uh, welcome to the 138th Sustainability Salon and uh, the first hybrid sustainability salon. So, hello, Zoom friends from Massachusetts and Washington State and Somerset County and Beaver County and uh, I forget everyone else. Somebody who I forget where they live. Oh, and Clinton, mm -hmm. our representative. All those are represented. I'm not sure where Greg lives. Um, Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh. Okay. <laughs> but he couldn't make it for whatever reason. And here he is. But almost all the people are from far away. And uh, so, and it was requests from people far away that led me to do this. And I want to thank the Breathe Project for. Uh, loaning us this brand new piece of equipment that they got to make hybrid meetings work better. Um, and uh, it's called an owl, because it looks around in every direction, depending on who's talking. And so I'll be in here. Hello, Zoom people. Hello, patio people. Hello, stairs people. Hello, porch people. <laughs> um, so I think uh, everybody uh, knows what the bathroom is. Um, that sort of thing. Um, and uh, I wanted to let folks know that um, one bonus of coming here is an opportunity to take home a book. I do not have enough books for everyone, but I have two copies, which the publisher kindly sent for promotional purposes. And I figured more people will come if there's a door prize. Um, I have a random number generator crafted by my daughter, my son, my kid. Um, and uh, uh, later on, we will do that. And I posted on Facebook that if you registered in advance, you get an extra entry in the raffle. So I, I'm not doing it with tickets. I'm just gonna assign a number to people on this list, and then we're going to roll the dice. <laughs> nice. <laughs> um, so uh, today we have a uh, very good fortune to have Christina Marusic, who is an amazing investigative journalist that has been, who has been um, plumbing the depths of corporate malfeasance and human vulnerability um, for years, decades. Not quite a decade. <laughs> okay, for many years. And um, did a series of articles that uh, someone, I get uh, four years ago or so, who that someone said, you really should turn that into a book. And we're very glad that she did. And um, so I'm going to turn it over to Christina, who will share data and stories. And uh, leave us all more informed and hopefully more empowered as well. Yeah. So awesome. Take it away, Christina. Thank you so much, Marin. Um, thank you all so much for being here. And folks on Zoom, thank you for being here. Um, before I start with the slide part of the presentation, I'm going to do a very, I'm going to briefly read from the book. Um, and the section I'm going to read about is about one of uh, someone who's here today on Zoom. Her name is Melanie Mead. Some of you might know her. She's a clean air advocate in Clareton, Pennsylvania. Um, and I'm gonna read just, this will be about five minutes of reading. Um, and then I'll, I'll get into our presentation. Oh, and I should clarify, uh, Marin mentioned that I wrote a, a series of articles and someone said you should turn that into a book. The series of articles was about uh, how Pittsburgh has disproportionately high rates of certain types of cancer and how our air pollution is a likely culprit. So this this book very is a national in scope, but it very much came directly out of my Pittsburgh reporting. And there's a lot of Pittsburgh in here, um, including Melanie, which is why I want to read to you about Melanie today. In 2013, Melanie had moved to a small town in North Carolina where she was working toward buying an apothecary and establishing her own natural medicine practice when her father died of heart failure associated with COPD. 
When she returned to Clareton for his funeral, she planned to help handle his estate and spend some time grieving with the rest of her family before returning to her life in North Carolina. But while she was in town, her mom's COPD took a sharp turn for the worse, and Melanie took over caring for her. Six months later, her mom died too. It was not long after, while Melanie was waiting through the fog of grief, when she first learned about how bad the air pollution from the coke plant was. A local chapter of the Clean Air Council held a community meeting and shared that Clareton had high rates of both cancer and asthma, which they said were linked to the plant's emissions. Melanie's younger brother, Tommy, had childhood asthma. It had been terrifying for Melanie to witness him having asthma attacks and being rushed to the hospital, but she had never before made the connection between her family's ailments and the Coke's ever-fuming smokestacks. Both of her parents smoked, which Melanie knows was the primary culprit for their health issues. But she was surprised when others in the community dismissed the idea that pollution from the mill could also have played a role. It seemed like there was an unspoken rule that everyone had to have loyalty to the company, Melanie said. I've never understood it. It's a pattern she sees a lot. When friends and relatives develop cancer, they tend to blame themselves. They'll say, oh, it's because I didn't exercise enough or I didn't eat well, she said. It's been ingrained in them that it's not anyone else's responsibility. She pointed to a 2021 analysis in which researchers calculated that even if everyone in Allegheny County had quit smoking 20 years ago, the region's lung cancer rates would only be 11% lower. Among the 612 other U.S. counties in the study, lung cancer rates would have declined an average of 62% if smoking hadn't been part of the picture over the last 20 years, indicating that environmental exposures play a substantial role in the region's lung cancer rates. I'm not trying to tell people to ignore their own responsibility, Melanie said, but it's very damning to a person's spirit to think they're at fault for their sickness and that they failed by not being able to control their own health. After both her parents died, Melanie started attending more clean air meetings, finding that she felt better when she occupied her mind. At one such meeting, she learned about the study that found kids in Clareton have asthma at more than double the national rate. That's when I decided I really had something important to do here, she said. Who could hear that and not want to scream and try to get Oprah on the phone and demand change? Before long, she was speaking at meetings and sharing her own experiences with living in Clareton. The foul-smelling air, her struggles with epilepsy, the illness in her family, and her belief that everyone deserves a healthy environment. She still had the little apothecary in North Carolina in the back of her mind, but she wasn't quite ready to go. Advocating for clean air in, her, in Clareton felt like her purpose a continuation of her dad's dedication to the community and staying in her parents' house made them still seem close by. As it turned out, any idea Melanie had of returning to her old life was short-lived. The same year her mom died, Melanie's oldest brother, Michael, died at age 45 from congestive heart failure associated with COPD. Two years later, in 2015, her older sister, Tammy, died at age 40, 55 from lung cancer. And in 2020, at age 41, her younger brother, Tommy, died from a blood clot in his lungs that may have been related to COVID-19. In the span of eight years, Melanie had buried every member of her immediate family. Living in a more or less perpetual state of grief taught Melanie a lot about trauma, self-care, and resilience. There were times it felt like she was drowning. She sought therapy and briefly took antidepressants, but in the end, she wound up relying more heavily on spiritual guides and community connections to heal. Now, though there's still sadness about losing so many people she loved, Melanie thinks of death more as a shifting spiritual state than an absolute end. Death has become so familiar that she's considering certification as a death doula, someone who coaches the dying through their journey out of this world, much in the same way a birth doula coaches parents on bringing new life into the world. Unlike hospice workers, death doulas deal less with the physical aspects of dying and more with the emotional, mental, and spiritual ones. Above all, they advocate for their clients' own wishes about dying, even if they're different from what traditions or pushy family members dictate. When we spoke in 2021, Melanie had st already started informally providing care for others who were dying in her community. She was with four Clareton community members outside her family at the time of their deaths, too. I think the traditional Western death experience leaves us feeling like victims, like we've suffered a loss and can't get it back. And that's not where I want to finish with death, she said. I'm interested in revisiting some of our older death rituals that can help people tap into feeling more empowered when they die. 
Coaching others through loss also taught Melanie how to keep going in her activism, even when it feels hopeless. When I first started working in environmental justice, I felt awful when things didn't happen as quickly as I wanted them to, or at the magnitude I wanted them to, she said. But now I'm learning that when things aren't going my way, I need to be able to find a place of peace. Sometimes when I stop looking for my way, I find that another way opens up. I will stop there. Are we, is the sky about to let loose on us? <laughs> People on Zoom, if all of a sudden we disappear, it started pouring on us. <laughs> Last time I checked, it was supposed to be okay. It looks like we're seeing. just on the outside of the storm that's just over there. But we're good till for another like hour, it looks like. Four all right. Hours. Well, I do have a tent. Spring <laughs> up over the stuff. But. We'll do what we can. Okay. Um, all right. If you could invent a pill that could eradicate two thirds of all cancer cases, how much money do you think you would make? Oh, we've got a pop up on the screen. I can get it, I think. I think it's complaining about not having- Which one? Because you're muted. Later. Okay. Yeah. Um, if you invented a pill that cured two thirds of all cancer cases, how much money do you think you would make? Do you think you'd be like Elon Musk rich or Jeff Bezos level rich? Probably one of those. Um, and as a follow-up question, if we knew how to prevent two thirds of all cancer cases, but nobody stood to get rich from it, would you still think we should do it? Yeah, uh, there's good news about that and there's bad news about that. So I'll give you the good news first. The good news is that up to two thirds of all cancer cases are caused by exposures we can prevent. And this figure is actually conservative. This comes from the US President's Cancer Panel, but a study conducted by researchers at the National Institutes of Health puts this number even higher. They say up to 95% of all cancer cases have preventable causes. One theory of cancer risk that I find really helpful is the causal pie model. And this idea comes from epidemiology. Basically, this model says that we all have our own pie chart for cancer risk. And it might include things like genetic risk factors, exposure to cigarette smoke, exposure to pesticides, and exposure to air pollution. Everyone's pie chart is unique with a unique mix of factors. But if any one of these factors goes missing, cancer won't develop in that person. So that would mean that if we can remove even one of the risk factors that's common in a lot of people's pies, we could prevent many, many cases of cancer, which is really exciting. But then there's also the bad news. And the bad news is that all of our market incentives are pushing us to continue focusing solely on treatments for cancer rather than prevention. This chart is from a market research company that serves investors. And as you can see, the global oncology market was valued at $286 billion in 2021, and it's expected to reach over $580 billion by 2030. That uh, little box in the upper left, which maybe folks on the stairs can't quite see, uh, it comes from the same web page. And I've, excuse me, highlighted the part where they're citing the fact that cancer cases are expected to rise by 47% from 2020 to 2040 as evidence of strong growth for this market. So in other words, a lot of people stand to get very rich from investing in treating cancer, but no one stands to get rich by investing in cancer prevention. Developing new treatments and cures is really important. I would never mean to imply that it isn't, but while we continue to search for a cure, we also need to do more to prevent cancer. And this means we'll need to rely on forces outside of the marketplace to get this done, which means regulations and policies. So those are some of the reasons I wrote this book, but like most people and probably many of you, I've also had my own personal brushes with cancer. In 2011, my younger sister, Abby, was diagnosed with thyroid cancer when she was 25 years old, uh, which is very young for a cancer diagnosis. And thyroid cancer usually runs in families, but no one else in our family had ever had it. So we were really left wondering if something she was exposed to or something my mom was exposed to while she was pregnant might have caused my sister's cancer. And when we went looking for answers, we had a really hard time finding any. Marin mentioned that this book came out of a series of stories I wrote. I'm also an investigative reporter. 
And in 2019, still thinking about these questions, I wrote a five-part series on cancer and environmental exposures in Pittsburgh that was titled Prescri Prescription for Prevention. And these are some of the headlines from that series. The series won a couple of awards and I got a really nice note from a publisher asking me if I'd be interested in turning this into a book. And for very long pandemic years later, <laughs> this is the book, it exists. Just a little more about me. I've been a full-time reporter for Environmental Health News since 2018. Before that, I was a freelance journalist covering a wide range of issues, uh, including the environment and social justice for lots of news outlets. I've gotten some awards for my reporting on the environment and I live here in Pittsburgh, really close by actually, I'm in Braddock Hills with my partner of 10 years, Michael, and our dog, Mochi. And as you can see here, Mochi is a very good dog. <laughs> my sister made a full recovery from her thyroid cancer, by the way. Um, she had her thyroid removed and has been in remission for more than a decade. She lives in Sewickley with her husband and my super cute niece and nephew and their goofy dog, who is also a good dog. I'll tell you just a little bit more about environmental health news. We are a project of the nonprofit Environmental Health Sciences, and we're a news organization that was founded by a scientist named Pete Myers, who is an expert on endocrine disrupting chemicals. He co-authored a book called Our Stolen Future in the 90s that was kind of the first to talk about the intergenerational effects of our exposure to these chemicals. And our mission is to drive good science into public policy and public discussion on our environment and health. So today I'm gonna go over some of the new research on opportunities for cancer prevention. I'll talk about how the war on cancer has been going so far for the last 50 years. I'll share some uh, profiles of people who are making a difference and I'll share some re resources for ways the rest of us can get involved. Some of the things I learned while I was reporting that series on the environment and cancer in Pittsburgh in 2019 were really shocking to me. And the first was that since we started tracking cancer rates in the 1970s, rates of childhood cancer have been steadily increasing. This chart is in the United States, but this trend is generally mirrored at the global level. And it's also mirrored in Pittsburgh. When you look at charts of childhood cancer rates, they all just are steadily climbing. And cancer is now the leading cause of death by disease for children in the United States. From 1975 to 2019, Incidence of childhood leukemia, which is the most common type of childhood cancer, increased by 35%. Nationally, one of every 285 American children is now diagnosed with cancer before they reach age 20. We've seen a similar increase in certain cancers that are strongly linked to environmental exposures, including multiple myeloma, non-Hodgkin lymphoma, and testicular cancer. And as you can see here, these uh, increases are even more substantial. That 76% increase in non-Hodgkin lymphoma is pretty shocking. When I was reporting that series on cancer in the environment back in 2019, I interviewed a very smart pediatrician and epidemiologist named Dr. Phil Landrigan, who would later end up writing the foreword to my book. And he said something that was a total light bulb moment for me. He said, this increase is too fast to be due to genetic changes and that our basic diagnostic tools for cancers like childhood leukemia are the same now as they've always been. So this also isn't just a matter of us diagnosing more of something that's always been there. This is a real rapid increase in childhood cancer rates. And the only other explanation is environmental factors, which means anything that originates outside of our bodies and our own DNA. So that includes things like smoking and diet, but also our exposure to cancer causing chemicals and pollution. Dr. Landrigan also pointed out that those lifestyle factors might play a significant role in adult cancers, but in general, kids aren't drinking and smoking despite this picture. So their parents might do those things, but over time, the percentage of parents who smoke and drink during pregnancy has dramatically declined while childhood cancers have continued to increase. One thing that has increased over the last 50 years is the number of chemicals that kids and all the rest of us are exposed to on a daily basis. Since the start of the early 20th century, more than 300,000 new chemicals have been invented. And these are novel materials that never existed on the planet until now. 
They're manufactured in vast quantities and global production of chemicals is on track to double by 2030. Some of these chemicals are really helpful and have improved our lives in important ways, but most of them have never been tested for safety. And among those that have been tested, most of the ones found to be harmful are still on the market, including chemicals we know are carcinogens. In the last 50 years, only five chemicals have been removed from US markets because they're harmful. The World Health Organization has determined that more than 100 of these chemicals can cause cancer in humans. So where do we find them? These are just a couple of places we come into contact with these chemicals. This list is not comprehensive and it includes some things that are suspected carcinogens and many other chemicals we come into contact with on a regular basis are endocrine disruptors, which I mentioned earlier. Those disrupt our body's natural hormonal processes and are increasingly linked to hormone related cancers like breast cancer and prostate cancer. Our contact with plastics is another major source of these exposures. A 2021 study by researchers in Switzerland identified more than 10,000 chemicals used in plastics manufacturing and found that about a quarter of them are substances of potential concern, meaning that they're endocrine disruptors, they can cause reproductive harm, they can damage specific organs or accumulate in our bodies, they're toxic to marine life, or that they are carcinogens. And more than half of the chemicals that the researchers identified as potentially concerning are unregulated in the United States. More than 900 of those chemicals are approved for contact with food in the United States. And at least a thousand of those concerning chemicals, including some carcinogens, they found are harmful even in very small doses. Uh, and then that bottom figure, that 20 billion in lawsuits, is from a study by a think tank that estimated that uh, because of increasing evidence of these health harms, uh, by 2030, we'll have more than $20 billion in lawsuits against uh, plastics companies. So now I wanna talk a little bit about how our war on cancer is going so far. We're much better than we used to be at treating cancer, but we're getting a lot more of it. In fact, one in every three Americans can now expect to get a cancer diagnosis at some point in their lifetimes. And just because we're better at treatments doesn't mean we've solved the problem of cancer. More than a thousand Americans still die of the disease every day. And treatment is really difficult. If anyone you love has ever gone through cancer treatments, you know that chemo can have side effects that can last for a lifetime and survivors live with the fear that their disease might come back and have anxiety and deja vu every time they have to go in for a follow-up scan. So you've seen the statistics, we're not winning this war right now. And if this story sounds familiar, you may also know a little bit about how our war on drugs and our war on poverty are going here in the United States. But the main reason we're not successfully preventing cancer is that we're not funding prevention. Globally, just seven to 9% of all cancer funding goes toward prevention. And I am personally a pacifist, but if we stick with the war metaphor here and we use the more generous estimate of 9%, this would be like spending 91% of our war budget on treating soldiers who come back from the battlefield wounded and only 9% of our funding on offensive and defensive measures that could stop them from getting hurt in the first place. So this is not a great strategy. I wanna share a little story about a public health victory that can help us reframe the way we think about cancer prevention. In 1985, a groundbreaking study had revealed that sudden infant death syndrome or SIDS was very rare in Hong Kong, where cultural norms had people putting babies to sleep almost exclusively on their backs. So in 1987, in response to this finding, the Netherlands started a public health campaign urging parents to put babies to sleep on their backs, which resulted in a really steep decline in SIDS cases in the Netherlands. In 1989, some American researchers felt very strongly that the United States should launch a similar campaign, but others felt just as strongly that we should not. Those opposed to the campaign said the evidence was very limited and no one in the research community could determine why putting babies to sleep on their stomachs made SIDS more likely to happen. Those in favor of launching the campaign thought who cares if we can save lives, we should act sooner rather than waiting to figure that all out. And thankfully those scientists won the debate 
and the Back to Sleep campaign was launched in 1994 in the United States. In the decades since then, we've seen a reduction in SIDS of about 50%. And more than 25 years later, scientists still don't completely understand why stomach sleeping makes SIDS more likely. So if we had waited until we had all those answers, we'd still be waiting and thousands more babies would have died as a result. So why are we talking about SIDS in a talk about cancer prevention? We're in a similar place, particularly with childhood cancer risk right now. And actually we have much more evidence about environmental risk factors for childhood cancer than we had on risk factors for SIDS back in 1994 when that Back to Sleep campaign was launched. Some people think it's really important to wait until we know exactly how at a cellular level exposure to certain chemicals cause cancer before we spend a lot of resources on preventing exposure to them. But we know from our experience with SIDS that once we've identified a clear risk factor for a disease, we don't have to wait decades to fully understand all the mechanisms before we can take action. And the good news is that there are some really smart, really capable people who are already working very hard on this issue. My book is all about those people. So this topic can feel a little overwhelming and scary, but my book is focused on solutions and on the unlikely heroes who are trying to save us from this problem. Um, and one of the reasons I did that is that, so these are some of the people I profiled in my book. In addition to those funding problems we talked about, another reason it's easier to advocate for a cure than it is for prevention is that we don't get a heartfelt thank you from the person we prevented from getting cancer. We don't get to meet them. We don't get to know them. It's really easy to feel empathy and want to pitch in and join someone's walk or help with their fundraiser when there's a picture of a little girl who's fighting cancer on a t-shirt or a Facebook page. And we can't do that with prevention, right? Normally the story of prevention is told through statistics like I've been showing you today um, and data and numbers. And those are really important, but they're really hard to connect with emotionally, which is one of the reasons I chose to structure my book through profiles of the heroes who are revolutionizing the way we think about cancer prevention. I wanted to humanize these statistics and help people feel connected and inspired when thinking about prevention. So I read to you a section about Melanie Mead, who's on our call, and I'm sorry to if I'm embarrassing you, Melanie, um, but Melanie is one of these heroes who is just so inspiring to me and is doing incredible work. And this picture is Melanie outside her house in 2021. Oh, there she is on the Zoom. You all know this already, but U.S. Steel frequently violates clean air laws and just pays the fines because it's cheaper than cleaning up their operations would be. And the town regularly sees some of the worst air quality in the country as a result. Melanie's family has been in Clareton for generations, farming the land long before the steel company came to town. And most of the men in her family worked at the Coke plant at some point in their lives, whether for their entire careers or for summer jobs. And some of the women in her family worked there too. Melanie was one of four kids, but as I read, over a span of eight years from 2013 to 2021, she lost both of her parents and all three of her siblings to cancer, respiratory disease or heart disease. So she's the only person surviving in her immediate family. This is the family home in Clareton where Melanie grew up. Her grandparents lived there before her family did, and Melanie still lives there today. Change is often slow, but it does happen. The local health department has stepped up enforcement of clean air laws in recent years. And as I'm sure you all know, U.S. Steel recently shut down three of the oldest, dirtiest Coke ovens at the plant, in part because of pressure from Melanie and other community activists like her. And this won't entirely solve Clareton's problems, but it's expected to help improve local air quality. And that's true for us here in Pittsburgh too. And Melanie's story really moves me because she's close by and she's fighting for the air I breathe too, obviously, but more importantly, because there are people like Melanie all over the country and all over the world who are facing impossible odds but they stay and they fight for the health of their communities. Okay, so 
how can the rest of us join this fight? Oh, I should add, there are lots more. I'm, I'm telling you about Melanie, but there are lots of other heroes profiled in the book. Um, if I told you about all of them, my publisher would not be very pleased with me. So if you wanna know the rest, you'll have to win the raffle or buy a copy. <laughs> so I mentioned that learning all of this can feel a little overwhelming and a little scary. It definitely did for me at first. And at first glance, it can seem like there are only two options. One is to become completely obsessed with this, <laughs> learn everything there is to learn and strive to become an enlightened organic goddess who reads every label and never lets a conventionally grown vegetable pass through their lips. Um, my mother-in-law has taken this approach after reading my book <laughs> and she loves sending me YouTube videos about like the cleanest cooking oils, but according to influencers. Oh. Or option two is to throw up your hands or bury your head in the sand because it's just too overwhelming. And as, oh, who was the artist? You Joe just, Jackson. As Joe Jackson says, everything gives you cancer. So it's probably <laughs> best to just not think about all of this too much. But I discovered an exciting third option, which is what I'm really here to pitch you on today and which is the whole point of my book. And that is collective action to reduce these sources of exposure in our lives and go on the offensive against cancer. So this doesn't necessarily mean we all need to become Melanie Meads and head to the street with bullhorns, although, especially among this crowd, if that sounds like a good time, you should absolutely do that. But there are lots of different roles that different types of people with different strengths and different gifts can help play in this movement. So I'm gonna briefly talk about a couple of broad categories here, but if you can think of additional ways to contribute that aren't listed here, I would strongly encourage you to pursue those and then also let me know and I'll add them to my slide deck. Um, and before I jump into those, I'll take just a quick moment to offer comfort to anyone who's stuck plotting out how to become an organic goddess or feels like that dog in the burning house right now. So while we push for systemic change, there are some things we can do to reduce our harmful exposures in the meantime. This is not a comprehensive list, but are some quick tips and there are a lot more in the book. Um, so one thing that I have found really helpful is when you're ready to buy new skincare or hair products or makeup or even household cleaning products, you can use an app like the Environmental Working Group's Healthy Living app to pick non-toxic upgrades. You can eat organic foods when they're accessible and you can use a high quality water filter at home like a zero filter. You can use an air filter at home too. Um, HEPA filters are best, but there's an easy DIY version with a box fan that is very easy to Google. You can choose a daycare that's been endorsed as non-toxic by a third-party program like the Eco Healthy Child Care Program, or you can encourage your existing daycare to get certified through that program. And there are a couple other tips here on safer schools and safer buildings. So that said, I do wanna acknowledge that a lot of people don't have the time and money to do all of this and that this problem is too big for us to entirely solve through our individual choices. I talked to a lot of experts when I was writing this book, and one thing they all said over and over is, we cannot shop our way out of this. We need to push for better regulations that will protect us all equally from these chemicals. So the first thing we can do is push for change is to support cancer prevention initiatives aimed at reducing our exposure to harmful chemicals. And one really easy, quick way to do this is donating time or money to organizations who are leading this work to help power up this effort. Another way is to sign up for these groups' newsletters and follow them on social media so it's easy to quickly act on and amplify their calls to action, which might be things like signing a petition, calling lawmakers about bills that they're considering, and voting on relevant legislation. And this is just a handful of the groups that are leading this work. And there's a much more extensive list in the appendix of my book organized by uh, like what area of work each group focuses on. The second thing we can do is push for better chemical regulations. And we can do this by contacting our local state and federal lawmakers to let them know this issue is important to us and urge them to support better chemical regulations aimed at preventing cancer. You can also sign up for notifications about proposed federal and state regulations related to carcinogens in the environment and contact key decision makers when those bills are up for consideration. And you can donate time and money to organizations lobbying for better chemical regulations. As you might imagine, the chemical industry has a lot more lobbyists. So we can also 
push for government reform aimed at restricting the power of lobbyists and increasing transparency in the US government. The last thing is applying market pressure. And we all know, you know, this idea that we shop with our wallets, but you can really amplify the impact. If you decide to switch from a hand cream you've been using your whole life and it's your favorite hand cream and you love it, you find it out has ingredients that are raising your cancer risk. So you switch to something else. You can amplify the impact of that choice many times over if you take a minute to tell both companies that you made that switch and why, because companies rarely hear from customers at this point, they're not gonna notice that you stopped buying their hand cream, but they will pay attention if they get lots of notes telling them that they're switching because of a specific ingredient. And finally, you can help spread the word and get others to help us join in this fight by reading and sharing my book. And I always end with this quote by cultural anthropologist, Margaret Mead, because it always makes me feel ready to go out and fight. I'll end there. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Um, and we definitely have time for some questions. If anyone has them, I'd love to take questions. Yeah. The, the mention of um, the, with the suggestion about not about divesting from mm -hmm. you know, these companies, where might we get that information? Divesting like your personal retirement accounts yeah. is one way um, to do this. Divesting retirement accounts is often, I just learned a lot about this because I wrote a story about this. I'm not like a financially, I'm not a financial advisor, <laughs> um, but a lot of times when we do have fossil fuel investments, they're in um, like ETFs, they're in mutual funds that are meant to mimic the economy. So they're really hard to separate out. It's rare that individual people have like individual holdings in, but there are a good number of new mutual funds that explicitly say they're free of fossil fuels. So you can go into your account or contact your financial advisor and ask to switch to a more sustainable uh, portfolio. Yeah, do you want to add to we that? We had a sustainability salon last summer, summer, sometime in the last couple of years on this very question. And um, uh, Josh Nauer, I don't know if you had the name spouse. Yeah. Uh, who lives two doors down. Okay. Uh, uh, so it was not a summertime one because it was, he was in his basement and I was in my kitchen. Um, uh, he said one place that seems to be pretty good, that's a good place to start is green century funds. So I have had, you know, took me a year to get around to it, mm -hmm. but then I set up a um, sort of a regular addition to that. And they have different, three basic funds, like one is international and one is, more volatile. Well, anyway, I just there's three basic funds. I throw some money at them every month. Yeah, that's a great option. And then you can also like investing in companies that are uh, finding green chemistry solutions or uh, advancing accessibility to solar power or wind or other renewable power sources. Um, companies that are making electric vehicles. So it's also about where you do put your money, right? And you can make some of those choices. You can find mutual funds that have those or invest in individual companies, which can be a little riskier financially. Um, and then there's also, there's a big debate that I again, just learned about, because I just did a story about this, about whether divestment is really effective because it's kind of a secondary market. So the company already made all the money from selling those shares at their IPO. And so I talked to one person at the Columbia Center on Sustainable Investment, the director of that uh, program at Columbia University. And she said, by necessity, if you sell a fossil fuel share because you think it's unethical, you're selling to someone who cares less. You're selling to someone who doesn't care about that. And so she questioned whether divestment was very effective because it would take 
a lot of people divesting to make a very tiny financial impact on a fossil fuel company since those they already profited off those shares. And her recommendation was becoming like an activist shareholder, essentially, was like show up at shareholder meetings, demand change, cause a ruckus. So there are a couple ways to think about it and a couple of approaches. That was a long answer to your question. <laughs> And that story, um, that story is actually coming out tomorrow. Yeah, tomorrow. It's about whether hospitals and healthcare systems should divest from fossil fuels. And it'll be on environmental health news tomorrow. Yeah. With uh, UPM, a lot of UPMC and Allegheny Health Network questions. <laughs> a lot of people like to just invest in the S&P 500 as like a straightforward way. And there is a, a, a fossil free S&P 500 ETF. You can just Google it. It'll pop right up. This is not investing advice, but it's the yeah. SPYX. That's a different one. It'll have different ethics than a than a fund that's sure. that's more holistic, though. So it just depends on how complicated and thoughtful you want to be. In your yeah, life. and also just to say the disclaimer again that um, don't take my financial advice because I'm not a financial advisor in terms of your retirement account. <laughs> Can you say it's environmental? Uh, where is it? Uh, environmental Health News is the outlet I write for. And that story about divesting will be up tomorrow. Thank you. Uh, I have lots of questions, but I I always have lots of questions. And so I'm happy to, I want to hear if there are more questions from the audience before I jump into a couple of little other questions. I have a question. Yeah, good. Outside voice. Um, <clears throat> when I first met Marin, it's because we belong to lots of organizations, gas, Sierra Club, etc. Not all of whom are as active today as they used to be, but they still exist. I still support them financially. Um, I had a daughter who died of liver cancer at age 35. And she had no risk factors whatsoever, other than the fact that she was very susceptible to chemicals. She was a cheap drunk. Caffeine worked like a charm for her. One aspirin would cure a headache, um, but it also worked the other way because your liver is what cleans toxins. Um, we live downwind, she lived downwind her entire life from the Cheswick power plant, which was just closed literally months ago. The, one of the oldest power plant, coal-fired power plant in the United States, let alone Pennsylvania. It up, up until 10 years ago, they didn't even have scrubbers. Um, but what made me feel, and, and coal, the air pollution from coal-fired power plants has tons of mercury. Mercury is a serious liver toxin. Um, the Sierra Club for many years, long before it was well known by the general public, had a campaign called Beyond Coal, and they started fighting to close down power plants that are chiral powered by coal. And it has worked um, along with natural gas being cheaper, of course, but um, belonging to those organizations, even if it's just donating your um and your funds, getting their information, participating in campaigns, um, it's worth it, and I think it's one of the best things that people can do who feel powerless. Is there's so many great organizations out there that need your support. Um, Sierra Club is one that I will, I'm a sustaining member 
and I think, well, it's also in my will that my daughter has to maintain that sustaining membership even after I'm gone. That's so all I want to say. Thank you. Thank you for sharing, and I'm so sorry for your for your loss. Well, often I think you've done just a really great job of distilling a lot of really powerful information. Um, and I would love additional distillation tips from you um, about the like when I think about how to protect myself from environmental uh, contributors to cancer, I think about like, I have like biggies, I think like filter my air, filter my water, and don't microwave food and plastic. Mm -hmm. Are there, what are the biggies on your list of things to like, okay, you're gonna like hit the big chunks of the pie. What are those? some of those big chunks and are my big chunks that I use, are those the big chunks that you would use? And if not, why not? Yeah. So those are really good places to start, particularly because they're relatively straightforward, right? Like get a good water filter, start filtering your air. Um, I, and not microwaving food and plastic is huge. Uh, I think the other big ones for me that have happened as a result of me learning all this and doing this research yeah. is phase are phasing out my um changing my personal care products mm -hmm. um women tend to use a much higher number of personal care products every day than men and uh there's also i write pretty extensively in my book, in my book about racial disparities and exposure to harmful chemicals through like beauty products um, and that is something that's harder to do because it's a million little questions, right? As opposed to like one new water filter. And so the way I've approached that, that has felt, um, not overwhelming for me. And I, I briefly touched on this in the presentation, but if I'm about to run out of something, um, I use that as an opportunity to find a non-toxic swap, a non-toxic upgrade. So if I'm about to be out of my face wash, um, the way I like to use uh, environmental working group, there's another organization called the Anti-Cancer Lifestyle Program. Oh, yeah, they have a ton of free resources online and all they do is these kind of individual choices. And so they have, um, like they do a lot of webinars and they're awesome. I just did a Facebook Live with them and oh. they're a very cool organization. They were actually founded by, this is an aside, but are you familiar with Stonyfield Yogurt? Yeah. Um, the guy who founded that company, his wife had breast cancer twice. And she asked her doctor, what can I do to make sure that this doesn't come back? And he said, oh, don't worry about it. And she said, that doesn't feel right. And so she started educating herself about this. She started what was a small regional organization with a nurse practitioner friend that now has expanded into this big national organization with a ton of really helpful resources. So they're going to have um, helpful tips on this. But uh, I find it easier that healthy living app has an option to like scan a barcode or like type in the name of a specific product and they'll give you a rating on um, how harmful toxic the ingredients are and that includes cancer risk but also like you know neurotoxics and this long other list of yeah. chemicals you don't want to be putting on your skin and hair um, but I find it easier to go in and just type face wash and then see what comes up and which ones they also give like a seal of approval to products that don't contain any of a long list of harmful chemicals on their list and just see what comes up that they have put a stamp of approval on and then like go look at reviews and buy it that way because otherwise you can get stuck like you pick one you scan it it turns out it's bad you pick another one you look it up it's not great it just is slower so the way i use it is generally to say i'm ready for a new shampoo gonna type shampoo in the app it's called healthy living if you want to download that um, EWG's app. They also have lots of this online if it's easier to go to the website, but the Healthy Living app is pretty awesome. Um, same with cleaning products. Um, with cleaning products, I've kind of just switched to like vinegar, you know, like the kind of basic vinegar lemon mm -hmm. stuff works really well. Um, there's a chapter in the book about one that's harder to do anything on an individual level about, but that was really shocking to me to learn about, which is medical supplies. Mm. Um, we get surprisingly high doses of 
certain endocrine disrupting chemicals through like IV bags and IV mm -hmm. tubing. And when you think about how vulnerable you are, if you're in the hospital getting those treatments, um, it's troubling. There's also been some research that shows that people get pretty high doses of these chemicals through their IV bags. So that one uh, requires a hospital to like change who they're purchasing these from. But I profile a company that's making versions of these without these chemicals. So you can ask your providers like, hey, are you aware of this? Can you look into this? Can you switch? Um, and then the other thing I learned a lot about in the book that I think about more now is like home renovation stuff. There's a chapter on healthy buildings. Yeah. Um, that stuff is really hard because there's a real lack of transparency in that market. Like stuff you're, if you're gonna redo your basement and you need to buy supplies, nothing has an ingredient list on it, right? It's not like food, um, but healthy building network has this really uh, similarly like a great app, um, a tool that is meant for like contractors and construction workers, but regular people can also go look stuff up on it. You can try to find a contractor who does like green building. Um, when I talked to, I interviewed Bill Walsh for the book, who's the founder of the Healthy Building Network. And um, when I talked to him, we were about to build a deck and we were like considering renovating our basement. And so I very specifically was like, tell me everything. Um, and he, he was like, it's really hard. Actually. He said for him, knowing as much as he does, there's like basically no choice he's happy with. Um, but it's something I hadn't thought about that. I was glad I started thinking about before we were about to do some of that work. Um, and then I think schools and daycares is another big one that, uh, I've wanted to share with the people in my life who have kids that, like kids are just exposed to a very disturbing amount of chemicals that can raise their cancer risk, like on playgrounds and at school and in daycare. Um, and there are really good programs that can help schools be healthier and safer. And so I think it takes like parents, caregivers, relatives of people who go to a school or a daycare, reaching out to administrators and saying, hey, this is really important. Here are some resources. Would you consider looking into one of these free certification programs? Mm -hmm. Awesome. Awesome. Yes. I, I was curious uh, with, with, the, uh, with the noting of the um, 300,000 uh, new chemicals in the last century, does that number include, um, include medicines? Yeah. So I think that it does. Um, it's just manufactured chemicals. So anything that's not occurring in nature. So it's a big number. And as I said, a lot of those chemicals are great. They really help us. We use them, they're useful. Most of them are um, not as life-saving as convenience driven. And the vast majority of them have not been tested for safety um, when it comes to cancer. And was that number found from like the ones that are patented? Good question. Um, I'd have to go way back into the archives of my fact-checking <laughs> to pull that up, but I can definitely send it to you afterwards if you're interested. Yeah. Other questions? I have infinite questions, so I can just keep rolling through, but I don't want to take over the dialogue, so I'm happy to... Is acetaminophen an endocrine disruptor? I'm looking at the Harvard website and it's like acetaminophen is known to be an endocrine disruptor. Have you? I mean, I am not up on the most recent research on acetaminophen. I do know um, that. I don't mean to quiz you. On, no, no, that's you know, okay. Like, there was some stuff came out about like acetaminophen in pregnancy recently that yeah. was very alarming a handful yeah. of studies for forever it's been doctors if you're pregnant say just take take some Tylenol um that's totally safe and it turns out it is absolutely not safe um which is a scary new development so yeah. I think I think when it comes to endocrine disrupting chemicals they're so ubiquitous that like we absolutely need to regulate them better. I recently learned that the uh, EPA has been supposed to start a program for 
testing and assessing the safety of various endocrine disrupting chemicals, specifically in pesticides. So that's a big place mm -hmm. we get exposed to them since 1996. In 1996, I think is the year they launched the program. They uh, have never done any, any of it. And through the decades have been sued four or five times by environmental advocacy groups and have had judge after judge after judge say, yeah, you're required by law to do this thing you committed to do, so you need to do it. And it still has not happened. There's nothing on the website. Um, and so one of the reasons we have this problem is that the EPA and other regulatory agencies have been underfunded and understaffed for many decades through many political administrations. And so in terms of things like acetaminophen, it's like, maybe the least of our concerns, but we really, really need our regulators to be looking at these things and taking decisive action, which they're not, right? Yeah, now. yeah, thank you. Um, another question that I, I've had for a little while and I've tried to talk to some folks about it, cancer, especially as Biden was talking about as, you know, he wants to like, you know, handle cancer in his- Moonshot. Moonshot yes. on cancer, yeah. And, and you've got a war on cancer. And shortly after, right around the same time, he sort of ended the COVID pandemic. But I'm seeing articles that are really starting to explore the oncogenic impacts, so the cancer-causing impacts, potentially, or cancer precursor impacts of COVID. Mm. And I'm curious to know if you have encountered any, any, you know, yeah, in your research, in your studies, and you're diving into this, did you ever look at cancer and COVID together? Most short, the short answer is not really because cancer takes so long to develop and COVID is so new. But so precursors. Yeah. So I think because of the extent to which we know that COVID causes inflammation in every system in our body, yeah. and we know that inflammation is a contributor to cancer risk, that totally makes sense to me and seems likely. Um, it, I think it's going to take a long time before we have like a good body of literature that looks at that problem just because of how long cancer can take up to you know 30 years to develop. Yeah. Um, so I think we'll be seeing that research a lot more moving forward. And we are getting to the point, you know, scientists are getting better at knowing earlier, like this is a cancer risk factor, yeah. right? Yeah. As like opposed to precursor analysis. Yeah, yeah. Right, yeah. right. And looking at like cellular changes that might indicate yeah. cancer risk. Yeah. Was there another? Was there a question? I, yeah. I, I, I heard something on the radio. Interesting. For years, they had already almost automatically prescribed. I know my mother had all the way people to give them aspirin, saying that somehow it would help to avoid heart disease. Mm -hmm. They really decided that actually there's no connection with other little effects. And the other thing that Austin is doing hard on is some kind of stomach pain. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if my mother's in her location. And it seems Half of the medications were to counteract the side effects of the med other medications. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, that's like that's another. I think that's like, oh. I think there's a medical thing. Too. Yeah, no, I've noticed that too. Yeah. I think you're right. Yeah. Pretty yeah. yeah. I, I was uh, curious, just with, well, first off, just cheers. Thank you for being an investigative reporter. Yeah. Um, yay for you know those actually trying to find information Thank um you. in in your your field just with the consideration of like investigative reporting is are these types of questions being asked more are there like you know medical investigative reporters like really sort of focused on asking this these type of human health questions versus other types of investigative reporting yeah i think um it's definitely a small, you know, it's small enough that I feel like I know most of them. <laughs> um, most of the people who write about environmental health specifically. Um, there's a woman named Sharon Lerner who has done really, really great investigative work for The Intercept for years. And now she's at ProPublica um, investigating like environmental crimes and environmental health, um, writing about like certain facilities. I cite some of her work in the book um writing about certain facilities that sterilize medical equipment for example um that have very carcinogenic emissions uh and the communities around them and how they're at risk um so i think and there's a whole program a really good program at nyu 
NYU's Graduate School of Journalism called SERP Science, Health, and Environmental Reporting. And we regularly have interns at Environmental Health News who, who are going through that program. And they're all like, make me feel so much better because they're really brilliant young people who are like, can't wait to get out there and cover these issues. So yeah, I think, I think more and more people are coming out of school, like aware that these are problems. And, you know, sometimes journalists who don't have that kind of background or training um, get kind of, can get stymied by the lack of scientific consensus. And I just did a workshop for some interns where we were saying, if you're writing about a community, an environmental justice community, for example, and there's no data on them because there's been no study done, that doesn't mean don't write about them. That means highlight the fact that there's no research. Why is there no research about this community? We need research about this community. Look at similar communities that have been researched and talk, you know, you can say there've only been three studies on this, but they suggest a link between these exposures and cancer. So we really talked about how to not get kind of caught. We can do things as journalists that like are much harder to do in a courtroom, in a class action lawsuit. We can say, look, everyone in this community got cancer. There hasn't been a study that shows it's coming from this plant, but intuitively everyone who looks at this situation thinks that's what's going on and the science we do say says you know xyz so i think um i get really excited when i see like young journalists who are coming out of school and they just kind of know how to do this or they're excited to learn and i do think we're seeing more and more people cover these kinds of issues yeah cool. yes i had a student um a few years ago who she got stuck inside because of covid so what she is a high school student. So what she did was a meta-analysis of research studies that have been done on PFAS exposure. Mm -hmm. And the one thing I thought was so scary was that when she looked at like, like um, gender, race, age, that the um, children had a super high spike for exposure to PFAS. And I almost wonder if it was because they're drinking milk and maybe the cows are exposed to it. It's something about being a child. So you, you look at all the different all the different groups are economic, she looked at economics, where you live in the country, and then she looked at um, age, and all of a sudden this big spike came up for children. And because of that, she, at the end, she got invited by the CDC and NIOSH to um, give a presentation in the spring mm -hmm. to talk about this. And it was, it was very significant. And I think the PFAS could be, you know, an area to really you know, keep our eyes on, especially for children, because we can avoid maybe some of the things, but kids are vulnerable. Yeah, um, I'm so glad she got that invitation. And there, I write about PFAS a lot in the book. And one potential reason for those exposures being higher in kids is that the same reason they're kind of more vulnerable to any toxic exposures, which is that um, for their size, relative to adults, kids eat more food, drink more water, breathe more air. So anything they're getting, they're getting more of. They also haven't fully developed the bodily systems that get toxic chemicals out of their bodies that adults have. So what gets in there is harder to process out. Um, and, and I agree that that's alarming. That's an alarming trend. And there's, I've been covering PFAS for quite a while now. Um, and when people ask me, like, what do we do about this? Um, there's a, a group of scientists that came out maybe a year ago, and they did a joint statement. Scientists around the world signed on who cover P who investigate PFAS. And they said, the only way to protect the future of the human species is to turn this off of the tap. We need to ban all non-essential uses of this at a global level immediately oh. <laughs> so the scientists who are experts in this like they're not messing around they're like we have to stop doing this um wow. yeah got a hand raised. oh someone's got a hand raised oh. do we have to oh it's barbara hi barb hi i recently heard a presentation about playgrounds 
this was on Halt the Harm Network, and they were talking about artificial turf. And they said there's PFAS in the artificial turf. So it could be that's one of the reasons that children get such high levels because they're on playing equipment that has this in it. Did you look into that too? I haven't read your book yet, although it's nearby here. <laughs> I'm ready to read it. Yeah, I mentioned I don't really get deep into artificial turf, but I, I, it's on my radar. And I think there's at least a mention that artificial turf is uh, a lot of reasons artificial turf is bad. And you're right, if it's on playgrounds, that could absolutely, sometimes the crumb rubber stuff too. Yeah. Yeah. Mm hmm Private car tires. Yeah, so right. I think that's happened in uh, New Jersey with the goalies. Oh. Uh, they were finding them having a chance for the kids. Okay. Because they were on the ground more, so they were breathing in. And From crumb rubber, out. yeah. Yes. Oh, I got a double question. First of all, what was the spike to her? What was the spike in age for the decons? I don't know. It was for children. I definitely saw children. Oh, my goodness. Well, yeah. yeah. And, and, and I'm just curious. I mean, I really have a propensity against the plastic toys. Did you do any yeah. looking into that? And I'm sorry if you spoke about it earlier. No, that's okay. Um, plastic toys are absolutely a source of harmful exposures for kids my my sister has two little kids I put up a picture of them at the beginning of the slideshow and I'm just like keep plastic out of their mouths to the extent that you can it's so hard because everything for kids is plastic you know she has switched at at least like their dishes and their forks and spoons you know she got like little metal baby ones that are saw or silicone um it's so hard to avoid and we've gotten some of the worst chemicals in children's toys have been banned. Um, but there are a lot that are still hanging around in the United States that other parts of the world have banned. So to the extent that you can avoid plastics in children's mouths, especially, I would say that is worth. Do, do you talk about that a lot in the book? Because actually I sell non-plastic toys. Okay. And the, the thing is that, quite frankly, it's a lot more expensive. It I, is, I yeah. Look at it and, and I understand, you know, they mm -hmm. want a lot of toys for kids. I keep saying you don't need a lot. Yeah. I get it. But, you yeah. know, so does it dive into that? A, uh, a little bit. There's a big focus on um, schools and daycares, which are a little more, you know, it's much harder to control what your kids are exposed to when they're not at your house, which is actually like most of their time. Right. Um, so I think I maybe have a passing mention about toys and plastic toys, but most of the focus is on efforts to create systemic change that would keep kids safer in daycare and at school. Yeah. Anybody else on the zoom? No other hands that I'm seeing right now. Okay. Oh, there's some chats. <laughs> Oh. But maybe no questions. Marcia mentions on the chat, Tylenol, acetaminophen, staggering numbers of liver failure with doses only slightly over the recommended dose. Wow. I've often wondered about the microplastics in the air just floating around and wondered if you would encountered I, I you're not sharing that's me sharing so this is you sharing i pulled off your sharing yeah you okay want, great no no no. i was just making sure that's great yeah um you're, yeah you're totally disconnected from okay me. microplastics floating around yeah that we breathe yeah like it seems like there's a lot that we ingest just yeah in, being humans around i just saw a new study out about this actually the um publisher i worked with for this book Island yeah. Press. They're a nonprofit press that specializes in books about solutions to environmental challenges. So a very niche, uh, mm -hmm. cool nonprofit press. And they have another author, Matt Simon, who is also an investigative reporter. And he had a book pu also published this year on microplastics called A Poison Like No Other oh. that might be of interest to you. Yeah, I'm going to do a joint webinar with him mm. sometime in September right. to talk about the crossover of these issues. But you're right, we're learning there. I just saw a research study just came out about how much we ingest microplastics through the air. And one crazy thing I saw Matt Simon do an op-ed on that I had never thought about was when you empty your um, 
lint trap in your dryer yeah. if any of your clothes are like microfiber uh -huh. the dust that comes out of there is just like a huge cloud of microplastics yeah. so he he was calling on you know there could be an additional filter that everyone he was saying the u.s government should mail everyone an additional filter that traps microplastics because they also go out your dryer vent and then they're just like in the air um but at home we now wear a KN95 when we empty our lint trap because I was just like, oh, I choke. I like cough every time I empty the lint trap. Yep, yep. Just yeah. microplastics. I've held my breath. It's the last thing I do in the dryer and I just hold my breath, do it and then leave the room. Yeah. yeah. It's, I mean, if it feels like a little paranoid, but it's honestly not a bad idea. <laughs> it's like one of the, yeah, one of the most potent sources of particles yeah. that I've seen in the house. The other really potent one is shredded paper. If you have a paper shredder, oh yeah, don't put it next to your particle filter if you don't want to know i will never use a paper shredder indoors again i will only take it outside now because it's just a particle it's just a spews particles it's amazing oh, i can see you that breathe them in and then all this stuff on the paper every single paper it's got like plastics on it and everything just goes right into you Woo. yeah so going along that same lines i just wonder like with my water's sitting out uncovered my food sitting out are the particles the nano pet Plastic particles going to just settle in my water. Is it better just to cover my food, you know, dome it, cover my drink? Maybe. I don't know if anyone's done research to see, like, are they just in the air in a way that, I mean, I think the bigger concern would be that if it's like, if it's to that level, then we're breathing. We're also just yeah. inhaling them. They're on our skin, yeah. <laughs> you know, so I don't know that it's, I don't know that it would make much difference, but I haven't seen, I haven't seen someone, you know, have a scientific examination of that so question. Is an N95 going to take care of that or not? Uh, for yes, it will filter those particles a out. Lot of it. Mm -hmm. I would also, uh, I think it fits into my filter your air, filter your water, don't microwave food and plastics. If your indoor air is highly filtered, then a, that's going to buffer you from a lot of the microplastics just raining down outside 24 7, which they found, I think, in the Arctic, the plastics and in the you know, the, the deepest parts of the ocean. So, I mean, you know, plastics. Well, and I'll say, I didn't get into this in today's talk, but throughout the book, um, I explore the ways that plastics and petrochemicals are all part of the same cycle and the ways that the climate crisis and the plastic pollution crisis are also part of our rising cancer rates and how, you know, it's the same solution to all of these problems. Um, I also, there's this, a story of a woman named Barry Breen that's woven throughout the book in each of the chapters who got diagnosed with breast cancer at the start of the pandemic. And um, she grew up in Oil City, which is about something like 90 miles from here and is considered the birthplace of the American oil industry. So I use her story as a way to talk about how Western Pennsylvania is kind of at the crux of this. The Shell Ethane Cracker is yeah. in the book. Um, we're really in this location where all of these issues kind of coalesce. Um, yeah, that's an aside. You have more questions, Mark? I always do, but I mean, I just take a while here for a second. Is that a serious question? We've hit a lot of my questions, though. Okay. <laughs> Other questions? Does anybody else have a question or a reflection? I had a comment about the you guys you mentioned like uh, uh feminine beauty products. I did notice in Pittsburgh there are like places like the refillery, and mm -hmm. I found another one in Lawrenceville uh, called Plants for Skin, and it's the natural beauty products that they're uh, nice. promoting their consumers oh, in cool. uh, containers, and then they're all natural products. So, so. That's lovely. Refillery. If anyone likes, I also have found after much looking. Um, an esthetician, a skincare professional who only uses non-toxic products in East Liberty, and she's awesome. So if you want to go pamper yourself and get a facial and you want someone who only uses non-toxic products, she's amazing. Uh, it's called Tend and Nourish. I think she's... we're going to get a downpour. Yeah, I'm having that feeling too. Less. Okay. And so I would recommend that um, this text be packed up. And right we move now. inside. That sounds great. Right now. Okay. Yeah. Hey, thanks everyone on Zoom for being here. We're going to move inside so we don't get rain on. Thank you all. You great presentation as always, Christina. I'm so thankful for you. Uh, without you, I probably would have given up so long ago. 
And I'm thankful for Marin to highlight you so that the people can make the connection. 